welcome to the podcast, Ian, from me and Chris. Um, I'm a little bit jealous of the weather where you are today down in Australia. I'm sitting here looking at the hammering rain and wind out the window here in the UK. Um, whereabouts are you joining us from exactly in Australia? So we're in Manly, so just north of the centre of Sydney. Uh, and it, today it was 28 degrees, so just a, a pretty mild summer's day down here. I don't, I don't say it's pretty jealous, but, but why not? You know, Chris, one day, one day in the future, it's going to be warm again here as well, isn't it? I know. I always think, you know, in the summer, I always think England's the best country to train in. I absolutely love it. And it's not actually the rain that puts me off in the winter. It's the lack of light. So at four o'clock, it's already dark here. And it's so hard to then get motivated to either go out on the, you know, on a run or whatever it might be. It's it's that part that, that I really struggle with. So, yeah, very, very jealous of you right now, Ian. And I'm going to have to ask you now to send us over a photo afterwards to use as the podcast header that's got you running in the sunshine with blue skies in the background. That'll be a little bit of a lift for everybody listening. All right. So listen, let's let's kick this off then. Um, you fairly recently moved out to Australia. It was the end of 2021 that you moved out there, wasn't it? And you were already a, was it, is that correct? End of 2021? Yeah. That's right, yeah. I had the opportunity to move out here for work at the end of 21, which is just as lockdown finished in Australia. So I've been out here just over a year now. It's gone very Okay. Cool. And your triathlon journey had started before that. You'd already, before you even met us and joined us, you'd done Ironman UK back in 2015. Um, and then okay. you joined us 2021 time. So first up, talk us through your your first experience of Ironman racing, Ironman, back in 20, Ironman UK back in 2015. Yeah, so, I mean, I was fairly new to triathlon, so my background is, I did a lot of sport as a kid, lots of different things, focused on running in my sort of early teens, late teens, into my 20s, then had family, all died off a bit, and triathlon was something I was kind of vaguely interested in, having seen Transworld Sport and the Ironman in Kona, etc., but thought it was for everyone other than me. Um, but that said, I, I did a sprint triathlon about 20 years ago, uh, and I remember actually being completely terrified of the 700 meter pool swim which when I look back at it and think about what what we do today is quite it's quite incredible so I did a, did a sprint um and then work took over for a little bit and I did my next sprint 10 years ago um and then Heaver Outdoor Heaver uh the Heaver Olympic Triathlon and then a mate of mine suggested that we did Wimble Ball 70.3 um I don't know if you remember that course but that was not I a fun I course. remember it very well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is not a course for anyone that lives in the flatlands. Um, so I did that in 2014, and it was a really hot day, and it was a brutal experience. Um, but I kind of got the bug. And something after that race just made me think, oh, I just would, would like to see what it's like to step up to Ironman. So I entered Ironman UK in Bolton in 2015. And, you know, shamefully, having worked with you guys for a while now and learned so much in the period of nearly two years, I just, I sort of trained myself for it. I followed that Think book um, and did everything it told me to do. And with the benefit of hindsight, made a huge amount of mistakes. But I quite, I quite enjoyed it. I quite enjoyed the challenge of being completely terrified. I remember sort of for six months before that race, just almost waking up every night thinking how the hell am I going to swim 3.8k uh, that was all that was all I was focused on it was the swim that terrified me um but I did it and I, and I don't know if you remember that that particular year but it absolutely belted down for the swim um so at Pennington Flash in Bolton for those that haven't done it it's not the most I guess glamorous of locations but when it when it's chucking down and you're sitting there terrified before your first Ironman it really is kind of a baptism of fire um and all I remember about that day was finishing the swim, and I came out okay actually. Just, just think, almost like I've done this. I've done, I've done this. Um, I've done the most scary thing. Uh, and then the bike, which again, looking back on it, uh, is is quite a, it's quite a hard bike. That um, it's back in the old day when it was two loops, Shep, Sheep House Lane and Hunters Hill. Um, I got to the end of the bike, and again, I thought right. All, it, all I need to do is walk this in and then Bolton Town Centre hits you with those big steep hills. But it was, it's, I mean, I've done a lot of things in, in my life and looking back on it, uh, 
it, it was something I was so proud of in myself for having completed it because the training and all, all the build up to it was something I'd never experienced before. Um, so yeah, no, it was, it was fantastic. And I had the bug, I wanted to try and do more. Um, but then I, I, I had a, a, I got hit by a car about six months later and broke my leg while I was out running. And that um, led to a series of, I didn't really rehabilitate properly, shall we say. So I, I didn't follow doctor's orders, tried to get back as quickly as I possibly could. And one thing led to another and I developed arthritis in my foot. And I kind of, for two years afterwards, thought that's it, game over. Um, that's That was my chance gone. I'm too old now. Um, I'm, I'm sort of hopping along. So I just, just kept fit and did a bit of swimming, a bit of running, a bit of biking, but nothing approaching what an Ironman would require. Um, and it, but it got to the stage I needed an operation to sort arthritis out my foot. So I, uh, I had that done, um, rehabilitated, but I think it was a bit of stroke of luck. I got put in touch with someone that was a sports related podiatrist that helped me fix the, the arthritis in my foot in terms of how the, the, my foot landed and referred me to a, a good physio. And this was just before COVID actually. So I, I managed to get myself into a physical condition where I could just do a lot more consistent, hard, heavy training. Um, and I've listened to you guys for years and I thought, well, COVID is you know, just coming to out there back end of COVID. I feel pretty fit. I need a bit of guidance to, to get myself up to the next level and then join you. Um, hence, hence we got in touch, did a couple of races last year. And then we upshifted, came down here. So that's a fairly truncated history. We can go into a bit more detail of any of those. But yeah, it was um, not standard pathway, I guess. It sounds like the experience of being hit by the car and thinking that you were never going to be able to do anything again was was quite formative in, in sort of in what would have been middle age, really. Yeah, no, it was. It was um it was it so i got i got basically i got clipped by a card i jumped into a ditch to miss it well to, uh, as a result of it and broke my leg and my foot and it was one of those moments you think when when it happened uh this isn't this isn't good um mm. but i think it was it was a bit of it was a number of things first of all when you're a kid and you're younger you bounce back from things really quickly this one it took years and I wasn't very patient. I didn't really go and seek guidance for it. And but and therefore I automatically assumed that it was the end of what I'd enjoyed doing for so many, so many years. And it only took, I guess, some smart physio and podiatrist to actually say, no, don't be silly. If you think about it in this way, you can get back to it. And then you kick yourself for having not been done it two years earlier. So yeah, it, it, it was formative. And it also then makes you think, you know, you need to make the most of what you got while, you, while you've got it. Um, but there are ways of managing all sorts of situations. Because again, when we're older, you don't bounce back from any injury particularly quickly. Uh, and I think you remember, Rob, about nine months ago, I had a bad Achilles. Um, and what I learned from my broken leg was actually, if you listen to advice and be a bit patient, you actually can come back from it. So that I took that on board and got through that Achilles problem as much quicker than I would have done, say, 10 years ago when I'd have been just forcing myself out. I'd been limping or taking a set of crutches and trying to do heel rips and that sort of thing. So, yeah, you do. It's, it's funny, isn't it, how I think this will resonate with a lot of people listening and watching that when we get injuries, we can either <laughs> take like this polarised view of either well, nothing, nothing can help me. I'm just going to have to either give up or put up with it. Or the opposite side, which is I'm in crippling pain all the time and I'm just going to crack on and I'm keep on, I'll am i keep on doing the training and try and battle through it. I think the light goes on in so many people when they go to see a good physio and, or a medical person who can say, no, no, I've, I've seen this tons of times and we can absolutely fix it for you. I think it can be a real watershed moment for people that, I think you alluded to it then. It common sense says go and see a professional, but for some reason we we don't do that. We we kind of withdraw into our own shell and think, I'm just gonna I'm just yeah. gonna hobble around with my injured Achilles for years. Yeah. Yeah, we also do it way too late, don't we? I mean, I, I'm probably still guilty of that. 
um, and you try and train through it. But I think the same, same is similar to training. When you're younger, or when I was younger, training meant going out and blasting yourself to bits for an hour or whatever it was, be it on the bike or be it on the run. And now you realise you can get better much more quickly by being by backing off and just doing stuff more consistently. But it, it just it's one of those things, isn't it? When you're in your early 50s, if you knew then what you know now, you just you just wonder, my God, I could have been so I could have been so different. But that's you know that's true in all, all walks of life. Hey Ian, as um as triathlon coaches, we've come across so many athletes with injuries and a lot of them stem from running. But in my kind of coaching career I don't think I've ever come across a serious injury from running that isn't due to the kind of natural running impact that an athlete goes through and that actually this is a slight anomaly and that a car was involved and obviously you know a very serious accident um I'm just wondering whether there's a you know a bit of a lesson for all of us so many of us run out on the roads and was the situation one that you think you could avoid in the future and whether you've got a little piece of advice for all the runners you know mostly in the UK who are running in the dark was it a situation where you were running on a lane with no lights and you know what what, what was the setup there so so in the, at the time we lived in Sussex so lots of country lanes um and it was of course I'd, I'd go down it was in the middle of the day actually it was in early December but it was the middle of the day uh, and I just happened to go around the course I always do running on the opposite side of the road to traffic there is no path there so you're right I mean you have to think carefully about where you run and the car was coming around the corner really quickly on the other side of the road um and didn't see me till it was too late and therefore I kind of moved out of the way just as it you know and I ended up in the ditch with my leg in a funny position broke broke it and my and my foot would I do I mean do I run I wouldn't do that now no um but I did it all the time but funnily enough, I, I feel always feel more exposed on the bike than I do running because I, th- I just find it easier to judge what's around me because you're going slower, whereas you've got your speed and the cars around you when you're on the bike. So, but after that, I mean, I, if I ran anything out other than brilliant light, I'd have a headlight on me and reflective clothing. But I don't think it would have made any difference. It's just where I chose to run. Mm, I think yeah, I was a bit so- lucky, but it wasn't it wasn't a super safe place to go with a benefit of height. yeah it sounds like one of those kind of crazy situations that you know you you're incredibly unlucky um and I've been talking to a few of my one-to-one athletes where um other athletes have had similar close calls um luckily they weren't ever hit by a car or anything but this is a time you know especially in the UK winter where we don't need to be running fast and therefore we can go off road and go into the fields, go onto the canal pass, whatever it might be. And, you know, there might be a little lesson there that if we don't need to be running on the roads, if we don't need to be running fast on the roads, then there are periods of the year in the training blocks where it's okay to go off road. Um, so yeah, well, I'm glad that's you made good, a full, yeah. full recovery. Yeah, that's a really good point, Chris. Actually, the reason I was on the road is I wanted to run quickly because when you run off road and it's muddy, you can't do the same pace and this is kind of that mindset shift isn't it you look at your time that you're doing per mile and think that's the most important thing where it actually isn't exactly yeah so let's talk us through then the the move to australia getting yourself over to australia and deciding to enter um i'm on new zealand as the big race and 70.3 western sydney in the build-up to it firstly talk us through how it's different leaving the UK in, you went, did you have a November time from memory, if that's right? It was just after we did Bowood, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so it was, I mean, I've been, I've, a little bit of background, I've been, the opportunity came up through the business I work with, who I've worked with for nearly 30 years now, um, and it came at the back end of COVID, and it was out, a bit out of the blue. Um, so I married, my daughter's 19, going to university, so it's a good time in life to do it. Um, and I've always been lucky. I've travelled a lot for work, but I've never been in one place. I've been with the same business, but pretty much in in London, in the southeast. So it was like, well, should we do it? Should we not? And when it might sound like a really easy decision, but it wasn't because there's so many things that sit around you that you have to take into account. Um, but we did it. Um, we moved November last year, so we moved the first week that Australia opened up. So Australia was still pretty closed down at the time. 
Um, and again, when you're in your late 40s, early 50s and you move, you realise that moving from hotel to Airbnb to stuff is quite a, quite challenging compared to when you used to backpack around wherever you did when you're in your 20s. And, uh, and actually, you probably don't appreciate the change that goes on around you from being in the same house and the same job for a number of years to everything completely changed. New friends, new community, new culture. It's a different culture. Right? It's very different, even though we speak the same, same language. Um, but alongside that, I had I had really enjoyed working with you guys. I'd enjoyed Bowood. I did Holcomb. And in my mind, I wanted to... The move here was around experiencing something different, but also the outdoor lifestyle. And we wanted to live by the beach and go in the ocean. And we'd heard lots of stuff about the sport, sporting culture. So it seemed that I just wanted to you know, leverage of what I did and see what I could do, but also a way of integrating into the community. So the swimming community here, the triathlon community of which you know, there's, there's a huge amount of stuff going on. Um, and I think, I mean, as with most people, when you do an Ironman, the best way to do it is just find something, enter it, and then chew your nails and wonder how the hell you're going to do it. <laughs> and I remember, I remember when I got here that New Zealand was always on the bucket list, just because it's kind of a mythical place. I've been there once for three weeks. I absolutely love it. I mean, it, it, it's it's a brilliant, brilliant country. And Ironman New Zealand probably to me is second only to Kona in terms of the, the mystique and the history. And it's so far away that it's not doesn't feel that real. So it was in March 22. Um, and I remember I had an ex email exchange with you, I think, Rob, saying, I've got here, it's boiling hot. How the hell would anyone train for an Ironman through the Australian summer? Uh, and I think you said to me, get up early. <laughs> That's, uh, and that's what I did. I used to wander, wander down to the beach and then there'd be these cyclists at half four, five o'clock. I've got jet lag at this stage, boy. just going off on their cycle at half four, five in the morning. So I thought I, would, I do want to do New Zealand. And then about two weeks later, it got moved from March 22 to December 22, which meant I could train over the Australian winter, have a little bit more time. So I just said, well, that's something's telling me that I'm going to do this. So, so I entered it. So the purpose was, you know, it was a bucket list thing, but I also wanted alongside all the change to have something that was familiar to me structure um something that was really challenging that i could sort of focus on alongside sorting out a new life and, and making sure we all settled out here so that that was the theory behind it and and to be honest it was probably one of the best decisions i made from a life perspective because it it helped me do that i, I um i meant you know we're involved in you know, around the swim and the surf scene down here and it meant that I had a purpose to go down there and train but I joined the tri club I got to know where to cycle I got to know people in and around that so yeah it was it was brilliant and then alongside it despite having new job moving houses I had this very clear plan about what I wanted to do and what I was training in the week and what what you know what I was looking to achieve later in the year so it was it worked out really well I think it's it's really interesting the the culture of training early in Australia. It it blew me away when I was over there for the year that I lived there that it was quite standard for the the ride to meet in the dark and for the first hour or two of it to be in the dark and everyone have lights. And I remember a friend of mine buying me Craig Alexander's book after he retired as as Ironman champion. And a lot of the photos in there of him training are taken of the the Sydney rides that leave at four in the morning and. And it's hard to kind of fathom and get your head around the idea that from a British point of view, you live in this, this beautiful, sunny paradise. Um, I remember being over there and one of my friends saying, yeah, that the kids can't do PE at school today because it's too hot. So they have the same sort of, you know, in England, they have to stay inside because it's raining and cold. And in Australia, there's just periods it's too hot for the kids to go outside. So it is a massive part of a, something you might not, might not consider, I think, before you go over there, right? No, exactly. And, and and a lot of the culture here, not just around triathlon and cycling, is go to bed early, get up early. I mean, if we, when we landed, we lived in the middle of Manly and we went for a walk at like half four in the morning. And there were people running at half four, five o'clock in the morning. And, and now it's what I'm used to. I mean, I come from Brighton originally. If you go down the beach half four, five o'clock in the morning, you see very different people, right? I mean, they're, they're not home yet. So, um, the whole but the whole thing is very natural and and even swimming now i mean we we go swimming when it's dark in the winter uh, which you wouldn't conceive of doing in the uk so you yeah, know it's it's 
it's early to bed, but it's up early to, to train. And actually I got to, particularly on the long bikes ahead of the Ironman, I was doing the six hour rides. I was getting up at four and out the door at half four in the morning. And I agreed to like, you know, love it. Although it was a Saturday morning and it didn't make Friday night fun. It was, I really enjoyed it because I could get on the roads. There'd be no cars. You'd see the sun come up over the, over the ocean. And then you'd climb up into the, 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 the park and you'd see the sun come through the trees. And it was like, wow, this is pretty special. And then you'd be home by 10 o'clock and the rest of the day would be, well, other than the brick run, the rest of the day would be yours. To, to fall asleep and be annoying to the family for having completely goosed yourself in the morning. But yeah, I really, I really like that bit because I, I would never, I mean, normal, in, we, we go up at five o'clock now and go, go down the beach, but I'd never do that in the UK. You'd sort of fall out of bed at half six to get a train. Um, and that's, so that's been really positive. Yeah. Contrast for us, contrast for us your experience of training for your first Ironman as a a sort of self-trained athlete with your experience of having trained for this Ironman along the way and and draw out some of the similarities and differences for people because I think a lot of the people watching and listening are in your boat. We get a lot of emails from people who are are first-timers and who are considering doing their first 70.3 or Ironman and it's generally kind of a, a help email. There's a reason we've got help yeah. as oxygen addict. It's a, I don't know what I'm doing. So contrast your experiences between the first time and, and your preparation through to Western Sydney 70.3 and then I'm on New Zealand. Yeah, I mean, the differences were huge. I mean, I, I followed that think book, which which is a fair, fair plan, but the context that's you're totally missing the context that sits around it. So if it says do an hour bike, I would just like completely smash myself to bits on the what bike for an hour three times a week, um, long runs to me, there would mix, I come from a running background, naturally you try and run as fast as you can, as far as you can. So a two hour run, I'll try and get close to seven minute mile pace, which is just insane. Um, you miss all the SNC, you miss all the, the way the whole thing fits together and you miss the understanding of what you're doing. All, all you're trying to do is get the hours on the clock, get the miles in the bank, and I remember feeling very, very tired. I remember Sunday mornings, which is when I used to do my long ride, just absolutely dreading getting out of bed. I just couldn't face it. It felt very lonely as well because I was doing it on my own. Whereas this plan that I followed, I was saying this to Chris the other day, I've really enjoyed it because I felt as though I felt as though I've been improving all the time. And I felt like the strength and conditioning and the swimming and the yoga has massively helped my running I, I'm running pain-free now I can run three hours doing the nine one walk and enjoy it you know I get myself out of bed and I'm, I'm running at six o'clock in the morning I see the sun come up I fuel properly I mean there was nothing about nutrition in that self-trained plan and nutrition actually has been one of my big learnings this year I used to probably go out for a run early in the morning not having eaten anything at all now I'll have something to eat and I'll fuel with a gel as I run and, and lo and behold, you feel the miles better. And then you come back and have a protein shake and you recover quick. It's not rocket science, but <laughs> this is the point you learn, even in your fifties, you do, you don't learn a hell of a lot. And it, and it just made it so much more of a enjoyable, progressive experience than what I remember last time, which was, I need to blow myself to bits, do the race and then, you know recover for you know do nothing for six months because i haven't got any mental energy left let alone physical energy so and then there's the community around the oxygen addict group which is which is brilliant because things you worry about you know you find out everyone else worries about it too and the imposter syndrome thing like like i was saying the bit that freaked me out about bolton was the swim I'm, i'm a reasonable swimmer but it's still completely you know it was a mental thing Whereas you, you join the group and you realise everyone feels a degree of that concern um, and stuff from pacing the bike and power. And you, 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 the more that you share your concerns and questions, the more you learn, the more you build, the more you develop as an athlete. So although I'm yeah, I'm sort of getting on a bit, I felt I've, in some ways this has been one of the biggest learning curves of my life like, over the last year because I've seen how it all fits together. And I actually feel good and strong, whereas last time I felt knackered and grumpy most of the time. You could probably get third party evidence of that for my family. I had a, um, Rob, I had a conversation with Ian um, very recently, and we were kind of looking back 
over the past year and his build up to to the Ironman and all these things. And you know, we we did look at numbers in terms of power and uh, the splits that he put out on race day and all, all these things that I'm sure we'll delve into in a bit. But the thing that I got the most kick out of when I was listening to his kind of review of the year were these two major points that one he basically did a full year of Ironman training and didn't suffer an injury and secondly he felt that it didn't have a negative impact on his family life on his work life on his social life all these things and I think those two key points often get lost and you know we we get so focused on I want to do my fastest bike split run split whatever it might be but at the detriment of family life, whatever it may be. And therefore it doesn't become a sustainable model. So at the end of the year, when you pitch to your family, oh, how about I do Ironman Copenhagen, for example, the family's reaction isn't going to be as supportive of you as you'd like. And when I had this conversation with Ian, you know, he did his race, he stepped back, he did a proper kind of step away from the structured training and all these things. And he's spending time with family now, which, you know, absolutely crucial. And now he feels that he's in a position where, one, he's got that inner motivation after the kind of post Ironman blues, but also he feels that he can pitch the idea of another really major event in the coming season to his family and the family are going to be supportive. And that, to me, is it just really excites me to hear that an athlete is able to balance all these things and he's still progressing. It's, yeah, you've done really well, Ian, in, in terms of balancing all that. No, thank you. But we'll go and get my wife and ask her whether she feels the same. <laughs> no, no, don't. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, one of the things looking forward is that I'm going to try and look at different races around Australia because it's a good way for us to explore the country. You go and do a race, then you have a week afterwards just to, to just what we did in New Zealand. So it didn't feel like you, 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 everything is on the race. You've got something else to fit around it. Yeah, that's great. All right, well, listen, all of this leads to talking about the actual races themselves along the way, 70.3 Western Sydney, and then I'm on New Zealand. I never done either race like you. I would have loved to have done I'm on New Zealand. The summer I was down in Australia, one of our tri club mates did New Zealand and she came back with the same experience that you had of it's a mystical place. It's not just, it's not just a race. There's something incredible about the location and the scenery. Um, so I want to hear all about it. So talk us through your build through to, through to 70.3 Sydney. So sort of what were your, what were your, your hopes, your aims going into that race and how did it play out? Yeah. So Sydney, so Western Sydney, it's, in, it's not actually in Sydney, it's in Penrith, which is two hours outside Sydney. So um, and it's based at the regatta where the 2000 Olympics rowing was. So that's where um, Rick Rave and Pinson won their goal. It's a fairly flat course, uh, but it has a reputation of being hot because it's in a natural bowl. So that was in September, but in the build up to that, so training had gone well, the race ready scores I'd been focusing on. I had COVID in July, which sent me back a few weeks. But really, I just I just stuck to the program and um, got got the sessions done. The bit that I needed to focus on for that is I got a TT bike before Bowwood last year, and I got Bottrell fit. I bought it, got used. I say used to it. I got used to sitting on it and getting down into the um, aero bars just about. And then Mr. Bottrell came along and changed the front end three days before Bowwood. <laughs> And I was all over the place at Bowood and I was like terrified and, and makes Andy heaps smile. Bike, biking was always my weaker sport, bit of the sport. So I actually just spent every Saturday ride focusing on getting comfortable in the TT and trying to find um, quiet roads where I could just get down. So it meant getting up early and going to quieter roads. And again, I felt it, I really progressed on that. So mm. Western Sydney, I mean, my previous best was uh, actually the 70.3 best was at Holcomb at 517 the year before. I didn't really have an expectation of time. I just wanted to do, I just want to get off the bike feeling I've done myself justice. That was my objective. So swim, I seated myself in the front group. I did 33, which was about there, thereabouts. And then the bike was a two lap course, fairly flat, bit windy and very pothole roads. And the first lap, I was like a Bambi on ice. I was just trying to get used to this machine. 
And then for, for some reason, something absolutely clicks on the second lap. I, I, I tend to have a habit of negative splitting these things because the first lap always just sort of gauge where, where the race is. And the second lap, I get the confidence and I get my head down and go for it. And the second lap was probably one of the most joyous experiences I've ever had on the bike. I was flying. I thought, I've actually cracked this now. It's one of those moments in your life you think, I've, I've never do this. <laughs> And I'm having fun, and I and I feel there's any impediments going quick. So I got off the bike, I think I did two thirty eight, which for me was some like 20, um, 15 minutes PB on the bike, and then did a one forty run, and the run was good, but uh, I I didn't really know what time I was aiming for. But my wife, as I got off the bike, shouted, "You're on for sub five. And I went, "Dad, don't be silly." And I thought, in almost like I didn't want to know that, just leave me. <laughs> just you shouldn't have told me that. It was one, one lap into a three lap run course and it was hard. Um, but in the end, I sprinted for the line. I got 4.55.53 or something. So I beat five hours, which was a long way ahead of what I thought I was going to do. So I was super chuffed. Um, and I just felt all of that hard work had come together. But actually, I'd so enjoyed the bike that that, that I kind of was the takeaway from the day. I can ride a TT bike. I don't feel like an imposter um i probably deserve to have one whereas previously i was a bit embarrassed of sitting on this machine that i thought should belong to somebody else so so i left that that race feeling pretty good and thinking well you know new zealand's coming up uh and then just got stuck into the program from 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 there through to what was it early december the only slight wrinkle i, I had a bit of reaction to a covid jab in in early november which along with you and Chris, I sort of backed off a little bit, adjusted training, but that knocked me a little because I felt crap for a few days. Um, and the last couple of, in the programme, you had the six-hour the six hour bike weekends. Um, I wasn't feeling brilliant for those, but I got, I got them done. In fact, this is where you, you guys were really helpful, and it you know, contrasted to my looking after myself. In my mind, I mean, I, I don't like not doing things, but equally, I don't want to do stuff that's going to make me worse or make me sick. Um, you know, or set me back. And I took advice from, from you guys and said, Look, go out, try three hours. If you feel crap, turn around and go back. Uh, and in the end, I got the six hour bike ride done. And, and the last, and the racing weekend, I did six hours. Nutrition was all to plan. I felt pretty, pretty tired actually on the bike. That wasn't the most joyous experience. That was a hard, hard bike. But then I got off and did the 45 minute brick run that absolutely flew. I thought, well, wow, you know, it's just, <laughs> I wasn't supposed to feel like this. Everyone tells me I should feel terrible. Um, and I was running much quicker than I expected to. And then the two hour on the next day went really well, fueled properly. So I just came out of the back of that, stuck into taper, feeling I've done everything I can. Um, you know, I was getting advice from lots of people. Like Chris said, get some tubeless tyres because it's really bumpy, the roads in New Zealand. So I did that, got the bike serviced. I just thought, I just don't think I can do anything more. In some ways, something's bound to go wrong because everything's gone so well so, so far. Um, so we flew out, the race was on Saturday the 10th, flew out on the Tuesday. And actually on that, that that's when it went slightly wrong. I got, I, I got, someone gave me a cold or a virus. So I, my, my, um, I used Whoop and HRV is quite, being quite important to me. In fact, I used Whoop before I joined you, before COVID because I had a habit of working hard, training hard, playing hard and feeling run down most of the time. My Saturday afternoons would be falling asleep on the sofa. So I used WHOOP and I learned a lot about HRV and recovery. And my recoveries that week were a bit lower. Um, but I tried to put it out of my mind. Also, there was this sort of, as it is in the run up to event, there's on the there's Ironman New Zealand group and you make some people you know doing saying oh the weather's going to be terrible there's a big low pressure it's going to be a big northeasterly it's going to be pouring with rain and then you just all you do is look at every version of the forecast that you can possibly find it's all saying the same thing yeah it's going to be pretty shit um, <laughs> <laughs> in some ways it's quite good because you think I can't deal with that you know I can't control that I've done everything I can I'm just let's just focus on eating properly, sleeping properly and getting to the race. So yeah, I got there on the Tuesday, drove down to Talcott on the Thursday, got my bike put together by the guys in the local bike shop. It was, the thing about Talcott is that everyone was so excited that the Ironman is in town because it hasn't been there for a little while because of, of COVID. So being in the coffee shop or the bike shop, everyone's like, oh, brilliant, well done, mate. 
I, in my registration pack, I had a letter from a local school kid saying, you're awesome. I, mean, I don't know who you are, but you're awesome and you're going to have a great race. I'm so proud of you. Like, all, the, all the athletes got these little letters from school kids. Um, there were a hundred, I've never seen so many volunteers. We've got yellow shirts on. They're all in the registration tent. They all just want to talk to you about your story. Um, it was so. It was such a nice place to be. So the whole event sort of rolled into it. It was Mike Riley's last call on the finish line, so there was a bit of bit of a narrative around that as well. So although like we had this impending doom of a weather forecast, I just felt as though oh, I'm so glad I'm here. This is this going to be really really good. Um, so well, yeah. Oh, the the other thing, lake the lake. Um, lake Taupo, I've never saw anything like it. It's a big volcanic lake, so but the water's all melt water, so it's crystal clear. Um, and you swim, and I went out for a practice swim. The bottom is just full of volcanic rocks that have been thrown out of wherever it is. There's no fish or anything. It's just like swimming in the most amazing water, freezing cold. But even that, you know, if you some people might think, oh, it's freezing cold, or I'm gonna have a right old moan about it, but it felt like a, just an amazing place to be, a very, you know, very lucky to be swimming in that, in that environment. Um, so I did practice swimming, et cetera. So race was Saturday morning. Well, looked at the forecast for winter bears and it said, oh, it's still going to be windy. And the thing that bothered me was I only have one set of wheels. I've got 60 quite deep rims. And the bike is, you're exposed to the wind. But again, there's not a lot I could do about that. So Went, went to bed, got up to absolutely chucking it with rain, got to the um, registration, did all your stuff, bumped into Gareth from the team. Uh, but the, you, you register your bike and you go down to the swim and they have a, a Maori welcome. They do a haka. So this sort of Maori tribe come out of the gloom in this boat rowing towards you and then they welcome you with this, with this haka. And I've always found stuff the All Blacks do pretty you know, pretty motivating pretty you know, pretty inspiring they did that for us it was mm -hmm. like oh <laughs> you get you get goose pimples um and on top of that so you do that and then it's the only mass start left i think in the world so you, you go out into the lake it's still fairly dark still raining obviously just just rained the whole time um and i was seated i put myself in the in the sort of first group so which <laughs> means you're further out into the lake so i kind of spread you out over the big start and you tread water for about 10 minutes and then a cannon goes and you're off. So was that like your reality. norm? In, sorry, Ian, was that your norm in terms of where you placed yourself in the uh, in the sw swim start? Uh, no, I, it, it wasn't. It was, a, you know, it was advice that I got from you and some of the other guys. I, I tend to be in the second group but at the front. But one of the things I do a lot down here is swim and the, I just found the benefit of finding feet and sitting behind people is absolutely huge and it's something I'm really comfortable with and we do we, we do a lot of group swims that are fairly fast and furious so I'm pretty comfortable with swimming in a in a pack now so I thought well, I'll go there and I'll hang in and actually at Western Sydney one of the things I learned was no matter where you start people are going to just crawl smash you to bits anyway so you might as well just go where you want to and, and fight for your space so I'm, fight, I'm quite confident of doing that which again, if you contrast to Bolton, when I was just probably tiptoeing into the water, hoping no one notices me, leave, you know, leave me alone, I'm going to swim on the other side of the lake. Now I'm sort of in the middle of it all. But it, you just, you're just a bit more confident and assertive, having got that experience. Um, so, yeah, the gun went, and I, I found some feet, and I had to work pretty hard actually to, to stay on them because everyone wanted feet, which was. Which, which made it quite, quite a bumpy first kilometre. And I was, um, and then we went on the first boy, I lost the feet and ended up having people follow me. But it was, it was just, an, a, just a great, I just really enjoyed the swim. I got out in 108, which is about where I thought I was going to. But, you know, almost with a smile on your face thinking, wow, that was as good as I thought it was going to be. Um, now, the thing about the Taupo is that the bike transition is, is about 800 metres from the lake, so you have to run up over um, a bridge and, it, and it's transition. They used to hand you your bike, which they, they didn't do this year because they didn't have quite a number of volunteers, but they hand you your bag and then you go and out, out you go on the bike, out, um, and then it just absolutely leathered it with rain for the next 
five hours pretty much um, and the wind and the wind came so it's a two lap course uh, it's pretty rolling so you climb up for about five six k drop down and then gradually climb up and then it's just rolling in into this headwind which was a bit of a grind but follow the nutrition plan and actually i, I sent to chris the other day i just had Bottrell's voice in my mind saying get out the wind get out the wind get out the wind so that's what i did when you came back you had a bit of a tailwind which was which was quite fun but then you repeated it again you kind of almost the whole weather pattern you know, crap weather wind back wind behind you and it was it was it was okay i was quite pleased so i got off in 540 which was a, like i think an hour quicker than i did at bolton um yeah very good numbers. man very good let yeah. me put um let me put that bike time into perspective um so it was five hours 40 as ian just said and so that turns out as a speed average speed of 19.7 miles an hour which is moving along on those kind of big chip roads and very rolling and terrible conditions and then if we relate that to his heart rate he was a um, average 132 which is really controlled for ian um it's exactly where we want him to be and average power, this is the one that interests me the most. Um, it's 147 average. Um, and so normalized 162, which is really low. And I'm saying that in a positive way, that he was able to translate low watts into high speed. And that's, you know, that's what we should all be looking for. It's not necessarily high watts are what we're looking for. But Ian, you know, he was talking about how much time he spent dialing in his TT bike, getting used to it, getting confidence on that, which then means that he's probably riding the corners a lot better. He's carrying his, spe his speed into the hills, all these things, which is going to smoothen out that power where he's able to essentially pedal the whole time, but at a very efficient rate and nice and consistent, nice and low. So there was no sign of heart rate drift. There was no sign of massive spikes in power, which would have then had effect on his heart rate all these things so in terms of how he delivered a five hours 40 it was super smooth really really impressive and i think that goes back to what you were saying what you were saying earlier about you got your fit with matt bottrell whatever it was three days before a half distance in the uk and, and lo and behold like what a nightmare come race day but it's a long-term investment isn't it you, you know a slot with matt bottrell for a bike fit is they're as rare as hen's teeth and you've, you've got to take them when you can to a certain extent but i'd expect it to take at least six months to properly bed in and probably upwards of a year before an athlete really feels okay i am now really really comfortable and as you've alluded to matt matt's as much an artist as he is a scientist the things he'll tell you during a bike fit are much, I think, much more valuable than the position he puts your body into. Some of the things he explains about the way your body moves through the wind and the sensation of feeling the wind, it's its almost bordering on, I don't know, th there's much more to it than just looking at a picture of a rider against the background and trying to minimize frontal area, I think. And it sounds like you've definitely got yourself to the point where for five hours 40 on New Zealand chip-sealed roads, you can cruise along in lower zone to deliver a 540, which is a very decent bike split on that course. And probably were you to go to, I don't know, Austria, Roth, pick a course with smooth tarmac and, and nice shallow downhills, you'd probably be looking at 515 for the same, same kind of power output, which, no. you know, that's not me blowing smoke. That's me saying that's the difference that New Zealand chip sealed roads makes. It's, it's 2K an hour. It's possibly more than that. So... Yeah. The fact you can get yourself really aerodynamic and go fast for low power sets you up for a really good run without any of the sort of Lionel Sanders style, I put out my best power ever, but my speed wasn't any different. It's not about the power that you're putting out. It's not about the biggest numbers. It's about the smallest numbers. No disrespect to Lionel, who's an amazing athlete. No, you're right. I mean, it, it's, it was so helpful because I hear his voice in my head saying, get out of the wing, get out of the wing, get your shoulders in. And it was good something to focus on mentally as well. You think this is positive. This is making me go quicker. Um, so I was targeting 190 watts, 147. You think, blimey, that's low. Um, but it was quick, you know, 32 Ks now in, in down here. Um, and the other bit around the bike was, because I'd done those six hour rides, it, it, mentally it didn't really phase you. You just think it's a long ride. 
but I've done this before twice and I've, I've run fine. Um, that's why the sim weekends massively help you mentally as well as physically. Mm. Cause you don't sort of talk yourself out. You don't back off. You think I've been here before and it was fine. Um, so in, interesting, I come, come down the hill to Taupo, sun came out, I was thinking, wow, excellent. Um, came into T2, my wife saying, you're on for 10.30, the tracker, the Ironman tracker says you're on for 10.30, you're 10th in your age group. And it's like, look, you know, I love you dearly, but don't, don't do that to me. But then I, look, I looked at my watch, because I didn't really set myself a time target. I had some sort of vague idea about what to do, but something around 11.30 would have been a brilliant result. But actually I've got, I looked at my watch, I'm 7.04 now if I do a 3.55 marathon, which is well comfortable for me, I can break 11 hours and that'd be like, that would be amazing. Um, so I bounced off on the run and then, and then we get this massive electrical storm and the wheels just came off. And that's, you know, this is what Ironman's all about, isn't it? You just think you cracked it and then it absolutely smashes you around the backside with a quick kick back as a as you uh, as you think you're about to master it but i think the run was an experience that um i'd like to say i wouldn't l like to have again but we've all it was probably my turn to have a bad you know, a suffer on the run really suffer bolton was hard don't get me wrong but this was this was another level so my quads cramped my hamstrings cramped i felt sick i was absolutely drenched and i had this huge storm and there was lightning hit the lake it hit, it hit something out on the lake about 200 yards away and um as i was running i was thinking they're going to cancel this they, they, they're going to pull us off and it wasn't just me the next day a few athletes were gathering around at the, at the sort of presentation ceremony they all said they thought it would be pulled because it was just one of those weather moments but it it sort of backed off a little and it just got just rained on <laughs> for four hours but it was um this is why I, I thought Iron Man for me was is always just one of those things that's so personal to you because you, you're two and a half laps in, you're absolutely knackered, you can't walk properly, your hamstrings are going, your ambitions for time have maybe gone. And the easiest thing to do is to sort of step off and go and, <laughs> and have a cup of tea. But for some reason we don't do it. We just we just grind our teeth and get through it. Um so it was a pretty miserable last two two laps. Um but I got through it and I was just so super, super chuffed. And the thing that the, the way New Zealand was slightly different to Bolton is that the, the support was phenomenal. You don't get the sort of wrestlers like you do up, up there. And Bolton has its own unique, um, amazing characteristics in terms of people watching. But the volunteers, when you cross the line, I had Mike Riley call me over, and you're an Iron Man, et cetera. Um, and then you walk into the tent and they have this sort of what they call the chief hug officer, which was this larger than life woman that just came up to me and said, do you want a hug? And I went, yeah. <laughs> so she came with this hug and I was bursting the tears. <laughs> and, and she was doing it for loads of people. I thought, can you imagine, have you come across that before? I've never come across that before. But it was it was such a nice thing to do. Uh, and then I got grabbed by a medical person because I obviously wasn't moving very well and just put on a bench and massage for the next hour or so. But the, the, the field tent afterwards, the tent afterwards with the recovery tent, they're, they're never sort of a, a, a place of joy, are they? The bodies everywhere. But this was like two inches in muddy water, steam coming off everybody. It was, uh, yeah, it was a brutal, brutal environment. But I just felt brilliant. I just thought, I, I've done. I didn't give up. I've done a pretty good time. Um, I was just super chuffed. I think there's a lot that Rob and I can say on the next section. I can see Rob's eyes are about to pop out of his uh, of his eye socket. So I'm not sure what kind of narrative you're going to go for, Rob. But um, from my perspective, um, you know, as I had a privilege of watching your kind of three month build into the race and had quite a few conversations on email, et cetera. And your dedication commitment pre-race was phenomenal and you were open to ideas you were open to actually backing um taking a bit of a step back from training when needed when your body needed it after your covid injection and all these things which is easier said than done when you know you're getting close to your a race and then when it comes to the actual a race um you did so well on the bike in terms of using it as a cap and not getting too excited and trying to fulfill your absolute potential on the bike and this is where as the coach I 
I just felt so frustrated for you um, that you did the best possible bike to set up the best possible run. And usually that's not the case. Usually someone does a great bike, at, you know, and that has a knock on effect on the run, but that wasn't the case here. And this is what I kind of really realized when we spoke a few days ago is that you spoke to me about um, how you felt on the bike and everything was good. You hit your nutrition plan, pacing was good, came off the bike, you were feeling motivated. Everything was absolutely on track. And then suddenly you talk about the weather having impact, which I'm sure it would have impacted everyone. But then you talk about this cramping in quads, calves, hamstrings, wheels start to fall off. And then it becomes a very different event. But that's the narrative that you gave me. And you were kind of looking for a, what, what happened? You were looking for answers. And the obvious answer, which we quite quickly came to, was that at the beginning of this podcast, you spoke about how you had some sort of virus, you had some sort of illness, but then you swept that under the carpet and carried on with, oh, but maybe it was electrolytes, maybe it was something else. But but no, I think any physician, any doctor would say that you were, you were ill and you still got to the start line, which um, you know, is a pretty brave decision in itself. But then you went through 11 hours of um, essentially extreme hard work and what can we expect from someone that's ill at a start line who's about to put themselves through kind of extreme physical hardship plus extreme kind of conditions so you know from the coach's point of view before you'd mentioned that narrative of the illness I was scratching my head because the the build phase was absolutely brilliant you did everything right nutrition everything right pacing everything right and I'd, I'd struggle to kind of come to an answer of why didn't Ian kind of fulfill his off the bike potential when it came to the run? But the answer's there. We've we've got it on paper. You said you were ill. So from that point onwards, it's it's hard for us as coaches to say you were ill, but let's let's forget that. Let's go back to nutrition. Let's go back to pacing. No, I think we've just got to kind of be honest with ourselves and say you were ill and how you got to that finish line. I've got absolutely no idea because you had about two hours of absolute hell on that run and everything was against you and everything kind of suggested you should stop now and as you said for whatever reason you didn't and I think you can carry that into your future races you know you've got this incredible mindset that is kind of unbreakable and you know you could see your target time slip out of your hands and you can see the perfect race slipping out of your hands but who cares you came for an experience you got an experience and hopefully you can build on that and physically we know you weren't at your potential on that day because of illness but yeah. you've gained a huge amount of knowledge and you got through hardships which personally I think that's what Iron Man's all about so um, Rob I don't know what your narrative was on uh, on the actual race performance and, and output that, that Ian put yeah well exactly as you've just said it's really it's the the really hard thing with Ironman is you can't pop one back and do a, do another one in two weeks time. If it's kind of a, a once a once or maybe twice a year event, isn't it? If you've got to the point where you've trained for this, if you pick up some kind of virus along the way and you feel good enough to do it, but not great, you're going to throw yourself in. And as we discussed, you're going to go and give it a go. For me, the big takeaway from this was what you said about, I battled through this and that's what I'm most proud of to me, actually, I know, I know it shouldn't be, but the times are relevant to me. I think you'll forget the time in the years to come. What you're left with is I did all of this preparation. I wasn't given great legs on the day. I didn't have the great race day experience in terms of feeling good on the run. You will do one day and you'll get to the finish line and you'll have a much faster time, but it might not be a satisfying looking back. I know some of some of our athletes' best experiences are not necessarily their fastest experiences. And like you've said, it's an amazing experience, but you've proved to yourself that you've got the mental toughness to get through an event like that on a day when you're not feeling great. On the day when everything does come together and the health is there as well as the fitness, I think it'll be a, it'll be a faster experience for you. The clock will have 10 something on it. Will it be more enjoyable? Well, you won't be in as much pain, but I don't know whether you'll get as much satisfaction from it afterwards. What are your reflections, Ian, looking back on that? I think, I think, you, I think you bang on. I mean, the satisfaction was I was in a big hole and I just 
no, no, not one point, I think, of giving up. And so I'm just going to get to the mm. finish here. And although the, the run wasn't, was maybe 20 minutes slower than I wanted, I didn't f- feel, I felt, uh, the next day I felt a sense of missed opportunity, but I didn't feel, uh, it was just an awesome experience. Yeah. And, and actually, same as Bolton, it was a great experience because it was miserable weather and a really hard course. And you put yourself through the mill and you come out the other side. This was better because it was even harder, even though I was fitter. And you really test yourself, don't you? I mean, I could do 10Ks every week, and I'm not sure you'd remember one from the other, but you do remember this. You will remember this in 20 years' time. And you'll be, you'd also kind of, this is what I, I learned from the last one, is that you do all sorts of things in life, but actually it's when you, in those dark moments on your own, or you're scaring yourself and you've managed to pull yourself through it, they're things that are only meaningful to you. Um, and that's what's important. I think it's not for anyone else, is it? No one really cares what time you do. It's it's how you felt and what you did, and you pushed yourself further than you thought you were going to. So yeah, I mean, at the end of it, I learned loads. I've learned loads. I mean, I feel like I've just gone back to school, um, and it was an awesome experience. And I would definitely go back. I'd do it again. I'd recommend it to anybody, even with the weather, even with the weather. Especially, especially with the weather, you know, you sign up for a, you sign up for physical challenge and and you get one that you're going to remember. (laughs) Right. Let me ask you this one. This is my last question for today. With the experience and knowledge that you've got now, the, the experience you've had over the last couple of years, if you could go back in time to the start of your triathlon journey, what advice would you give to somebody who's just starting out on there if we've got a listener or a, or a viewer who's just starting out their iron man journey now what advice would you give to them that you wish you'd known back then i would i would get someone to give you some structured coping but it's like this i mean i think you'd expect me to say that but it it it's a game changer really because it gives you context and a focus around what you're going to do and it allows someone else to make the decisions for you. And, and I, I quickly learned to trust that the program worked for me. Um, but the big, the big thing above that is patience and consistency. Nothing happens in a week, nothing happens in a month. You've really just got to stick with it. Um, and as Chris said, you know, that's the first time I've had that opportunity and I've come on so far. I mean, just take the bike, for example, compared to Bowood, where I was white knuckles thinking, oh, I can't do this. And just a year later, you know, doing something in my 50s that I thought I probably would never get close to doing just because I stuck at it. Um, and it, I'd say it's a long game, that patience and that consistency, but also set yourself a big, big goal. and commit to it because if you don't do that then you've got nothing to work towards that's brilliant that's really great hey well listen i've I've really enjoyed hearing your story i've really enjoyed it it's um it's always great when an athlete has an amazing experience and sometimes that's winning the world championships and sometimes that's going faster than they than they thought they would but equally valid i think is i got to do this race and the Maoris came out of the water in a boat and lightning struck the water. I mean, I think you literally experienced that maybe once in your life, running outdoors as lightning strikes the water. So that's a, that's a, a, a world best experience right there, I think. Yeah, yeah. Thankfully, the Maoris weren't on the water because that would have not been so good. But yeah, that, that was, yeah, it was, it's great. And if anyone wants to go to New Zealand, just, just do it because... It's such a rich experience, not just the race, but the whole place. Amazing. All right, Ian, listen, thank you very much from both of us. It's been awesome talking to you and uh, we wish you all the best for the future. Good stuff. And thanks, guys. Couldn't have done it without you. No, thank you, Ian. It's been an absolute pleasure.